Hello everyone and welcome to the weird, scary and horrible parts of humanity. So during my video on the last of the 9-11 hijackers that we explored, Sayed Al Gumdi, Austin Taylor 6152 and a massive shout out to them suggested looking at the 77 bombers. And five months after leaving your comment, Austin Taylor 6152, that's exactly what we're doing. We'll be looking at them in alphabetical order. So 7-7 was a series of four coordinated suicide attacks carried out by Islamist terrorists which targeted commuters on London's Cheban bus system during the early morning rush hour between 8.49am and 9.47am on the 7th of July 2005 as a protest against the United Kingdom's involvement in the Afghan war following 9-11 and the Second Gulf War which the United Kingdom had been involved in since 2003 as well as opposition towards British support for Israel. It is believe that the bombing was coordinated by Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, who at the very least had knowledge of the attacks. While 7-7 would claim 56 lives and 784 people were injured, representing the deadliest terrorist incident in the United Kingdom since the 1988 bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 near Lockerbie in Scotland, and was the United Kingdom's first Islamist suicide attack, it should be noted that it was far from the first nor the last attack on London's public transport system, and it didn't have the same geopolitical impact of 9-11, and other than for the families of the murdered and the injured, who in many ways would never recover from the horrors of 7-7, London and indeed the United Kingdom seemed to bounce back rather quickly. There is a memorial to the 14 people who died at Tavistock Square, the Tavistock Square Gardens Memorial, where the explosion of the number 30 bus took place, as well as the 7 July Memorial in Hyde Park. But perhaps what shocked the public the most is that unlike 9-11, these weren't terrorists who flew in months before aboard a Virgin Atlantic flight. These were local lads who all, bar Jermaine Lindsay, had been born in the United Kingdom and all had grown up in the United Kingdom. So in essence, they were homegrown terrorists which sent bewilderment and shudders across the United Kingdom. Also, as this video has been made in March 2024, Britain is in the midst of unprecedented Islamophobic attacks, with ITV News reporting that following the Hamas attack on Israel on the 7th of October 2023, Islamophobic incidents were up by 600% in the United Kingdom. This has been instigated by extremist Tory politicians and far-right-wing TV news channels like Talk TV and GB News. The aim of this, albeit brief look into the 77 bombers, as there was only four of them, is not to add fuel to the fire in the hatred of Islam, nor categorise Islam as a violent extremist religion. So if that's your belief, please don't leave that sort of rhetoric in the comments. If you want to misjudge and miscategorise Islam, then GB News, Talk TV and the Daily Mail all have their comments section open. And if you feel that way, you'll certainly find far more people who concur with you. Our aim is to simply analyse these four young men and find out how they went from being brought up in the UK to wanting to kill their own countrymen in unprecedented ways. And with that, we begin with the youngest of the 7-7 bombers, Hasib Hussein, who was the youngest at the time of the bombing, at the age of just 18. Hasib Mir Hussein was born on the 16th of September 1986 in Leeds in the United Kingdom. He was born in the Leeds General Infirmary, where his mother, Manisa, worked as an interpreter for British-Pakistani families. The youngest of four children, he was raised in Holbeck in West Yorkshire, an inner-city area of Leeds, and his father, Mahmood, worked in a factory. The couple had emigrated to the United Kingdom in 1975. He had one brother, Imran, and two sisters, Asiya and Aliyah. He attended Ingram Road Primary School in Holbeck. There, he was said to be a normal and unremarkable pupil. His family had a good reputation and neighbours would tell BBC News that they got along with them. Indeed, The Independent would note that Hussein, quote, was an unexceptional teenager who had an ordinary upbringing, end quote. His father would describe him as a gentle boy, telling The Independent, quote, If a fly came into the house, he would catch it and take it outside. If there was a caterpillar in the garden, he would make sure it was safe, end quote. 
In September 1998, at the age of 12, he went to the South Leeds High School, renamed the Cockburn John Charles Academy in 2018, for his GCSEs, where he maintained a good attendance record. South Leeds High School is a co-ed high school for students aged between 11 and 16, with 1,147 students as of April 2023. Another 7-7 terrorist, Mohammed Sadiq Khan, would attend the same school, with Khan widely considered to be the leader of the 7-7 plot. However, Khan was 12 years older than Hussein and they did not go to high school together. During his GCSEs, Hussein would study the English language, English literature, math, science, Urdu and design and technology. He also gained a general national vocational qualification in 2003. The general national vocational qualification was a certificate of vocational education available to people of all ages and was offered alongside GCSEs and A-levels. It ended in 2007. However, the Telegraph and the Daily Mail would erroneously state that he had not gotten a single GCSE. He then went on to Thomas Daneby College in Leeds, earning an AVCE, a Vocational Certificate of Education in Business. This was a vocational qualification available in colleges in sixth form and withdrawn in 2007. He ended up gaining his AVCE in June 2005. Upon leaving school, he told teachers that he wanted to be a cleric. While at high school, he also played for the local cricket team and was a member of the Holbeck Hornets soccer team. He also attended gyms in nearby Beeston where he boxed with his brother Imgarn. He also loved mountain biking. He got his driver's license, however in October 2004 he received a caution for attempting to steal a hat and a pair of gloves. Teachers would describe Hussein as a slow gentle giant who did not spread leaflets of hate mail. This was backed up by his father, who would state, My son was good in school and he was good in college. He was not fanatical in a religious way. However, his academic prowess was contradicted by numerous media outlets. In 2011, BBC News would note that Hussein was not a high achiever academically, and indeed The Independent reported that he got minor disciplinary discussions with teachers relating to graffiti and was not delivering his homework on time. But despite this, and attempts by the Daily Mail and the Telegraph to cast Hussein as a social misfit and a college dropout, the Independent quoted the family, noting that things were looking up for him. He was going to enter an arranged marriage and would be attending the University of Leeds in September 2005, something that would never come to pass. However, things changed around 2001, but he concealed an almost Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde personality from almost everybody he knew, his friends, his family and his teachers. He met Muhammad Sadiq Khan in 2001, as well as fellow 7-7 bomber Shehazad Tanweer. How he met them is unknown, however, the trio would go to the Stratford Street Mosque in Beeston, a suburb of Leeds, and about two miles or three kilometres from the centre of Leeds. The trio also began attending the Hamara Youth Access Point. It is there that Mohammed Sadiq Khan acted as a mentor to youths at the centre. Moreover, his older brother Imran was a close friend of Khan and often played cricket with Tanweer, Imran met Tanweer at Tanweer's family's fish and chip shop in the 1980s. His family would blame Khan for getting Hussein into extremist Islamism. According to BBC News, the zealous extremism in Hussein manifested in 2002 when he went with his family to Mecca in Saudi Arabia for the Hajj pilgrimage and then went to Pakistan for four weeks for his brother Imran's wedding with the marriage arranged. The wedding took place on the outskirts of Islamabad. This was his second visit to Pakistan. The first was when Hussein was eight months old. On his return to the United Kingdom, he became more religiously observant, including growing a beard, and he wore traditional robes. He would only stop doing this as 2005 came to pass. Indeed, former classmate Matthew Judge would tell the Daily Mail, one day he came into school and had undergone a complete transformation. Almost overnight, he started wearing a toppy hat from the mosque, grew a beard and wore robes. Before that, he was always in jeans. 
Indeed, a neighbour would tell the Association of Chief Police Officers, now the National Police Chiefs Council. I thought he had been brainwashed. I do not know by who. He also wrote on his religious education school book, Al-Qaeda, No Limits. He also raised concern among two teachers shortly after 9-11 when he passed two fellow pupils a note which said, You're next, in reference to 9-11. He would openly speak of his support for the radical Islamist jihadist movement and said that he believed that the 9-11 hijackers were martyrs. In July 2004, he flew to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and then flew to Karachi, Pakistan, aboard Saudi Airlines Flight SV-714 on the 15th of July 2004. The Independent would note that while there, he was most likely involved in a Madras religious school, with the then President of Pakistan, Pervez Musharraf, alleging that Madras religious schools were involved in terrorism. It is also believed that he may have made contact with the banned Sunni group Lashkar-e-Taiba and the army of Muhammad jaish e muhammad but in reality, what he did in Pakistan remains unclear to this day. He was most likely there on his own, and simultaneously how long he was in Pakistan for is unknown, as there was no computer records of him leaving the country. However, he would have had to leave pretty quickly in order to make it back to college. By 2005, his two sisters had left home. Asiya to marry and settle nearby with her three children. A Leo, in the words of a Daily Mail, had sparked a family scandal by running away with a Sikh lover. But his brother Imran, as well as Imran's wife Shazia, and Imran's two younger daughters lived with a family, with Hussein still living at home. For March 2005, the 477 bombers... Tanweer, Hussein, Khan, and Jermaine Lindsay all began preparing homemade bombs. In mid-June 2005, Magdi Asdi El Nashar rented a flat which was on 18 Alexandra Grove in Burley, Leeds, to Jermaine Maurice Lindsay. El Nashar was an Egyptian from Cairo and had spent the last five years undertaking postgraduate studies at the University of Leeds. El Nashar got to know Hussein as a result. Al Nashar flew back to his native Cairo for a six week holiday shortly before 7 7 and was detained by Egyptian authorities on the 15th of July 2005 and held for 25 days on suspicion of involvement in the 7 7 attack before being released on the 10th of August 2005. This flat, however, would become critical and the bombs used in 7 7 were constructed in this apartment with the bombs placed in a refrigerated box to maintain stability overnight. Indeed, when the landlord tried to visit to warn his new tenants about a possible electrical fault. Hussein blocked the keyhole and warned the landlord that he could not enter because he was possessed. On the 28th of June, for year before bombers, including Hussein, did a practice trip down to King's Cross Station, London, from Luton Station. Hussein told his family on the 6th of July that he was heading down to London and that he would be back on the evening of the 7th of July. On the morning of the 7th of July 2005, he headed down to Luton Station. There, they purchased return tickets to King's Cross Station, knowing that they would only be taking a one-way journey, departing at 7.30am. And Hussein had told his family that they were just visiting friends. They then said goodbye at a Boots Pharmacy, on the concourse of King's Cross Station at 8.25am and went their separate ways. It is believed that on 7-7 Hussein was to take the Northern Line train and set the bomb off. However, the underground was temporarily suspended after Khan, Lindsay and Tanwir's bombs had all gone off. At 8.55am he called the three other bombers, leaving a few messages stating, I can't get on the tube, what should I do? But in reality, they were all dead. This gave rise to one of the most famous images of Hussein, a lone, solitary, quasi-ubiquitous giant of a character with a massive backpack on his shoulders in a Boots pharmacy on the concourse of King's Cross Station, wondering what he was going to do. In 2006, Professor David Wilson of Birmingham City University would state that any rational individual would have dumped the bombs and ran, and Wilson hypothesised that Hussein might not have wanted to go through with the attack as he was alone in the Boots Pharmacy on the concourse of King's Cross 
and telephoned his friends, and his hesitation in wanting to go through with it led to his delay, and ultimately missing the intended northern line. Wilson noted that with his friends already dead having telephoned them, Hussein probably didn't have a lot to go back to in Leeds, and in a sign of desperation went through with the attack. In reality, the 7-7 inquest in 2010 was to find something pretty different, and that Wilson really was talking out of his ass. There was no sign that Hussein didn't want to go through with the attack. Instead, he had to buy a replacement battery, a 9 volt Duracell Plus battery, which cost £4.49, which was purchased at the Boots Pharmacy. He then went to a nearby McDonald's for 8 minutes, where it is believed that he replaced the bomb's battery, which was not working. This led to him missing the prearranged time and place to detonate the bomb, and he called the other attackers for help with the tube lines closed from the Boots Pharmacy, wondering what on earth he was going to do. Realising that they were all dead and with the tube lines closed, he instead went for a bus. And so, with the tube lines closed, Hussein boarded a number 30 bus at 9.20am, 50 minutes after the initial explosions on the tube. The number 30 bus is a Transport for London contracted route running between Hackney Wick and Marble Arch via Dalston, Highbury, Islington, Euston Road and Baker Street, before ending up at Marble Arch Station. The bus had left Marble Arch at 9am and was driven by George Pasagadakis. A passenger who was sat next to Hussein would tell ITV News that he saw Hussein continually going to his backpack and almost playing with it, wondering when he was going to let it off. However, when the bomb went off, the passenger had already left the number 30 bus. With gridlock in London and traffic backed up and police cordons in place, the bus was already on diversion along Tavistock Square. Knowing that it would take time to move, Pasagadakis told his passengers, I'll open the doors, it's up to you. Ultimately, Pasagadakis knew that it would be quicker for his passengers to walk. Many passengers got off and unbeknownst to Pasagadakis, he had saved countless lives. But he would tell Channel 4 News in 2015 on the 10th anniversary of the attack, I wish all of them got off the bus and instead of them being dead, I wouldn't mind to die. Pasagadakis then went to press a button to call the depot to figure out what he was going to do, but as he stretched across to press the button, he heard the thunder of the bomb exploding with metal bits dropping and the windscreen blowing away. The bomb was let off at 9.47am. While this was complete happenstance as Hussein had intended to blow up the tube, the bus explosion at Tavistock Square was the second deadliest of the four explosions, with 13 people killed in the image of a destroyed double-decker red bus, synonymous with London, epitomising the tragedy and horror that London and the United Kingdom had witnessed on 7-7, and that Islamist, extremist, jihadist terrorism had truly come to London. But Hussein's family had no idea that their son was involved in the attack. Yes, they knew that he was travelling down to London with three friends, but they had not heard from him since the morning of the 7th of July. It was at 11am on the 7th of July that the Hussein family got a call from Asiya while at a cricket match, saying that there had been a series of explosions on London's transport system, with the belief that their son may have been a victim in the attack not a terrorist, but a passenger aboard the city's tube or bus network knowing that he was heading down to London. With the attacks having unfolded, his parents frantically contacted Scotland Yard at about 10.20pm to report him missing. At 4am on the 8th of July, Imran set off with some cousins in his old Vauxhall Astra to try and find them, including touring several hospitals around London to try and find Hussein, but with no success they headed back up north. His father Mohammed would tell the Independent on the 2nd of August 2005 that his wife calling Scotland Yard about their son and their son being in Leeds linked the police to Leeds and allowed them to uncover the intricate operation of the attack with a family source stating, I like to think we may have helped in some way. Before we called, the police had no idea Hasib was there. A family liaison officer was sent to try and find him, and it wasn't until the 10th of July that Imran took the officer aside and said, I think Hasib may be the bomber. Indeed, Hussein's credit cards and driver's license were found at the number 30 bus. 
Once it was confirmed that Hussein was indeed the bomber, his family would release a statement noting that Hussein was a loving and normal young man who gave us no concern. We are having difficulty taking this in. Our thoughts are with all the bereaved families and we have to live ourselves with the loss of our son in these difficult circumstances. We had no knowledge of his activities and had we done, we would have done everything in our power to stop him. He was buried at Cottingley Cemetery, a Muslim cemetery in South Leeds on the 2nd of November 2005. His grave was one of numerous graves vandalised on the 15th of June 2012 in what was most likely an Islamophobic attack. The Daily Mail reported that the family regularly mourned their son's passing, with fresh flowers regularly left at Hussein's grave, as well as Hussein's family home around the 7-7 bombing his death, including the name Hasib on the front gates of a family's home, with the Daily Mail bizarrely stating on the 10th anniversary of the 7-7 attacks in 2015, his family appeared to have ignored the terrible circumstances of his death 10 years ago by mourning his passing as if he were a victim himself. Memorials to Hussein have been criticised by family members of those who passed away on 7-7, with Robert Webb, whose sister Laura Webb died in the bombing, stating that it was very disappointing that a tribute was erected on the front gates of the family's home to Hussein. In July 2020, Mahmoud Hussein would tell the Daily Mirror that he had spent the last 15 years trying to come to terms with how his son had been radicalised and why more had not been done to prevent radicalization of young men in Britain. Mahmoud Hussein blamed Khan for brainwashing his son, stating, Something happened in those mosques. There are Islamic scholars, people who come from Pakistan, Bangladesh and India. They have done something terribly wrong. Those evil people who radicalized Hasib and the others, I feel very, very angry. But nothing was done beforehand. His father also wrote a book, my Son, The 7-7 Suicide Bomber, A Father's Anguish. This was published by Empire Publications in 2019. All of the money raised from the selling of the book went to the victim support of 7-7. Mahmoud would also tell the Daily Mirror, I carry the thought of the victims with me every day. I feel so sorry for them. Their pain is unimaginable. I mourn for them. And coming up and continuing with our analysis into the 7-7 Bombers, in alphabetical order, we will be looking at Muhammad Sadiq Khan. Thank you for watching. Please do yourself a favor and hit that subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified of when new videos come out. Also, why not hit that like button and leave a nice comment? It helps more than you know and your support is truly appreciated. Until next time, stay awesome, stay classy, be kind to everyone you meet, have an amazing day. And remember, the truth is always more interesting than fuck shit.